talking about living in freedom, and we've been, been going through the book of Galatians, and, and, and as I share with you, each week kind of builds, it's like, it's like Paul's writing a letter, and he, he, he's laid the foundation in chapter one, you know, where he said that, that we're, we're to live to please God, we're not to live uh, for the approval of others, and then and he builds on that in chapter two, where it says in Galatians 2.20, he says, for I've been crucified with Christ, yet I live, not I, but Christ who lives in me, and so from that, we build from that, not pleasing, not, not, not trying to please others, Others or approval of others pleasing God, we know that we are not defined by our past because our past is behind us. We are now alive in Christ. And then he gets to the next chapter and we find that our worth, because of what he's done on the cross, that our worth is found in him and only in him. And then last week we looked a little bit deeper into uh, the building on that because of what he's done on the cross, because our worth is found in him, that we found out that we are no longer slaves. We're no longer slaves to sin but we are children of the king. We've been adopted into the family and we are heirs with him. And so each week it kind of builds. He's building to the, the big ending that's coming up in a couple of weeks, the beginning. But today we're gonna to talk a little more about it, build a little more on that. And today is from Galatians 5, 25, and it's walking in step with the spirit. Walking in step with the spirit. Galatians 5, 25 says this, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. That's simple, right? Since we as believers, since what Christ has done for us on the cross, since we are made new in him and we are, are no longer alive, it's no longer us that live, but it's Christ that lives in us, then we need to learn to walk in the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, we need to keep in step with what the Spirit's doing. To walk in the Spirit means to live a life that depends on the Spirit's power. Did you get that? To walk in the Spirit means that we are to live a life where we depend on his power. Stop trying to do it on your own. Some of you need to hear that. Stop trying to do it on your own. It's by his power. And what does his power help us do? Well, it helps us to grow in godliness. It helps us to learn to obey God's commands and to experience increasing intimacy with God. So let's dive a little deeper into that this morning on keeping a step with the Spirit from the Scripture since we live by the Spirit. So first, we're living by the Spirit. The Christian life is not meant to be lived on our own strength or according to our own desires. Did you get that? We are not to live this life according to our own strength. I don't know about you, but my strength is not very strong. In fact, I believe I have more weaknesses than I have strengths. Anybody with me? And I find that the, 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 the more I live this life, the closer I walk with God, the more I realize how weak I am. And yet so often we still try to live this Christian life. We still try to walk with God in our own strength. We still try to do things our way and according to what we want and according to our desires. But if we go back to what Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. And crucified implies death. The old me is not there. So why, why am I living according to my own strength? Why am I living according to my own desires? We are called as believers to live by the Spirit. Romans 8, and you notice that we've used a lot of of Romans, Romans uh, chapter 7 and 8 especially, is a good commentary on the book of Galatians, in case you're wondering. So read the book of Galatians and read Romans 6, 7, and 8, and you'll get a good good, uh, idea how those work together. But Paul says in Romans, he says, the mind that is governed by the flesh is death. Yeah, right? I mean, that's, that's just, he just says it. The mind that is governed by the flesh, the mind that is governed by our own strength and according to our own desires, if we're going to live that way, that's a mind governed by the flesh, and that's death. He says, but the mind that is governed by the Spirit, capital S, is life and peace. So often we try to live this life and with our desires and the way we want, and I don't know about you, but, but that's failure, isn't it? Right? We, we get what we want. That, that, that's failure. I know I, I, I'm talking to my daughter, and I said last year, in the beginning of the year last year, when God was putting me through the ringer, when God was just, was just taking everything out of me that, that I didn't need, at the time I thought I needed it, and I realized then that I was glad that God didn't answer some of those prayers. Because those prayers were prayed out of my selfishness, out of what I thought was best for me. You ever prayed a prayer like that? Where where you told God what you think he should do? You've been there? I'm not the only one that does that? Hey, God, here's a good idea. 
Here's what I think you should do. And God's up there going, are we going to do this again? Come on. When we surrender our lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us and empowers us to live in obedience to God's will. You can't live in obedience to God's will on your own. Can't do it. Because that's a mind that's governed by the flesh. That's a mind that's governed, that's, that's ruled by what you want, by your desire, your will. We, the Holy Spirit empowers us to obey God. It's through, the Spirit, it's through the Spirit that we experience true life and freedom. And the theme of the whole series is living in freedom. It's not until we live by the Spirit. It's not until the Spirit is in us and working through us that we truly have freedom in this life. That's when it happens. Paul writes this in Galatians 5, 16 to 18. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So if you're here this morning and you're wondering how to break free from the things that you've been living, it's walk according to the Spirit. Will it happen all at one time? No. Some will. There are some times when God sets us free that we are free indeed and the, the chains are broken right away. You know that. Some of you had habits that you were involved in before you came to Christ, and God took those from you. But then there's other things in our life that God wants to work out in us. God wants, and I don't know why, but I'm glad he does. I don't know why it, it took 59 years for God to, to, to get that self-doubt out of me. I don't know why it took so long. I, I, well, I do know why. This guy, Right? I do know why this guy wasn't helping him. I wasn't walking according to the Spirit. And so I, I want you to know that we, we got to live by the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, he says in verse 17, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Do you get that? Listen, there's two natures in us, right? There's the earthly human nature that's prone to sin. And when Christ comes in, the old is gone, the new has come. But the earthly nature is still in us, but also the godly nature. That's small g. That's not capital G. We don't become gods, right? This is not Mormonism, not Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. We do not become gods. We become like God in that we are his children. We become righteous. We become in right standing with him, okay? But that, those two natures now are at war with each other. You all feel that, don't you? You all know that. The old life pulls at us, doesn't it? The old insecurities, the old, the old self-doubt. You know, just because God has, has worked something out in your life doesn't mean the enemy's given up that easy. Right? There are, I, I know God has done a great, a great healing in me in the last year and a half, and yet there are times where self-doubt rears its ugly head. And the devil tries to whisper those thoughts in me. You know, you know, just, you know, you with me? You know what I'm talking about? He comes in. But when we live according to the Spirit, we've got to not listen to those. They're at war with each other. And so what we've got to do is we've got to live according to the Spirit, live by the Spirit so that when the old nature rises up, the old man, the old woman rises up, the sinful nature rises up, we can say no because we're walking in the Spirit. We're listening to what the Spirit says. The second thing is we live by the Spirit and we've got to keep in step with the Spirit. Walking in step with the Spirit requires intentionality and humility. This is, what, this is the part I love about it, because this is the tension between uh, what, what God does in our life and what we do, okay? So, so we're, we're not robots. We don't come to Christ, and then we just kind of, we, we sing the songs the same, and we all act the same. We all raise our hands this way or this way. We all do. That's not how it is, right? Uh, there, there's a tension between uh, God doing things in our lives, but then the expectations God has us for working. In other words, we're working together. We're working together. The Holy Spirit is working in us, but there's the expectation that we are also working on ours. Paul says to work out your salvation in fear and trepidation, right? We're working out our salvation with the Holy Spirit. But too often, we overstep our bounds and try to do things that only God can do. And that's the tension that I love that's walking in this. And so what happens is this. It requires intentionality on our part. Listen, keeping in step with the Spirit means we've got to be intentional about what we do. We've got to get up and pray. 
right? You, you want to hear from God. If you're not hearing from God, if you say to me, Pastor, I'm not hearing from God right now, okay, how's your prayer life? Are you being intentional about how you're living? Are you reading your Bible every day? Are you listening to the, the, the kind of music that makes, that makes your spirit happy and joyful? I'm not saying you should never listen to anything else because music's music, right? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if you're trying to hear from God and, and, you, and you got stuff, you're listening to stuff and put stuff into your, into your spirit that's not pleasing to God, then you're going to have a hard time hearing from God because you're hearing from everybody else. We've got to be intentional about it. I promise you this. I promise you this, though. When we become intentional about the things of God and serving God, like, like if, you haven't been, if, you, if you've not been praying, right, maybe your prayer life has been lacking lately, and you say, Pastor, I'm going to get up tomorrow morning, I'm going to pray. I'm going to get up 15 minutes early tomorrow morning, and I'm going to pray. You know what's going to happen? You're going to have the worst night of sleep you've ever had. Am I right? You're going to have dreams about cheese, and you're going to have dreams about mushrooms, and you're going to have dreams about when you're in high school. I don't know about you, but I, I, still, have the, I still have the nightmarish dream that I'm at my locker, and I can't remember my combination. Anybody else have that one? And I'm, let, I'm just there, and everybody else is going, the bell rings, and I'm just like, I don't know what's the combination, right? I still have that's a nightmare, you know? I don't know if you have that, but I still have this. But we, we, what we have to do is we've got to let God do what God does. And if you, and if you, and, but then you've got to do what you do. So I promise you, if you be intentional about it, the, the enemy of your soul is not going to be happy. He's going to fight you. So if you say, I'm going to get up and pray tomorrow morning, you're going to have a bad night. Just know it. But that's okay. You get up 15 minutes early anyway, and you say, I'm going to do it. And if the gates of hell are coming against me, guess what? It's not going to matter. In fact, sometimes in your life, if the enemy's fighting harder against you, that means you're on the right path. You with me? Sometimes when you, when the all, when it seems like all of hell, it's like every demon in hell is coming against you, rejoice. It means you're on the right path. Because if you're not on the right path, sometimes he'll just leave you alone. Just let you do your own thing. Humility, intentionality, and humility. Listen, keeping in step, humility means we align our thoughts, our words, and our actions with the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Here's that little song I'm going to sing to you, and you're all going to, you got to help join in and sing with me. Ready? Because we've got to keep our words, our thoughts, and our actions in prompting the Holy Spirit. Ready? Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the... Come on, do the motions, too. So be careful, little eyes. And then it's be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little mouth, but for me, it's be careful, big mouth, what you say. How many big mouths, right? Be careful, big mouth, what you say. Be careful, hands, what you touch. Be careful, mind, what you think. Be careful, feet, where you go. Think about that. If we got up every morning and sang that song, we would be walking in step with the Spirit. Because that's exactly what we're to do. Our thoughts and our minds and what we hear and what we say and what we touch and where we go need to be in step with what God wants for our lives. That's what humility is. We've got to understand that what God has for us is way better than what we think we should get. I'm so thankful. There's a lot of prayers that I prayed last year that God didn't answer. Because if God had answered any of those self-centered prayers, I probably wouldn't be here today. I'd be somewhere else, doing something else. But God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, said no, not answering that one. Aren't you glad about that? Okay, there's a picture of a dancer, and it's a ballerina. And I know many of you, this is easy for you. How, how many of you pulled a muscle looking at the picture? Yeah, it's like, no. Maybe 20 years ago. It's like, it's like, I don't even know if I can get my hands like that anymore. Okay, so in this picture, we have a dancer, right? And we're talking about keeping in step with the Spirit. And hours of practice. If you've ever done anything that took, required hours of practice, anything you do, you know, uh, 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 do a performance. I, I played, I mean, remember the, the, the uh, production Guys and Dolls? No? Nobody Guys and Dolls? 
when you see a guy reach for, you got, you got that? Nobody said? Okay, the guy, Nathan Detroit, right, was played by, uh, what's his name, Frank Sinatra. Maybe you heard of Frank. And I remember I played his part in high school. And I remember the lines we had to memorize and the songs we had to sing and the dance moves and all this stuff and all the hours you put into it, right? And like the ballerina, the dancer here, all the hours they put into it. And think about this. As the music starts playing, they have to learn to keep in step with the rhythm of the music. So Swan Lake starts playing, right? Dun, 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 dun. And they're doing all that, right? And they're keeping in step. But what happens, though, if the band director taps on it and he starts playing William Tell's Overture, dun, 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 and the, what's the ballet got to do? They've got to keep in step with the rhythm of the music. Even if the rhythm of the music changes, they've got to change with it. And that's kind of like living our lives. We've got to keep in step with the spirits leading, with the maestro in charge of our life. And I will promise you this. I will promise you this, because I've been doing this a long time. I promise you that sometimes you're going to be doing Swan Lake, and God's going to start playing the William Tell Overture. And you're going to think, why? But understand, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. And sometimes he wants us to keep in step. Did you ever play Follow the Leader when you were younger? Right? And I, when the teacher... When the teacher made me the leader, that's when the fun started. Because we were under desks, we were crawling. He said, Stanley, don't do that. No, too late. There we go. Right? I love that. Well, that's how God is. God wants us to learn to follow him. And sometimes God will even change the tune and change the rhythm of the song just to see if we're paying attention to him. Right? You ever been in a conversation with somebody and you know they're not listening to you? Right? Their mind's wandering off, and so you start saying things like, and so then the pink elephant walked into the room, and you just start saying random stuff just to see if they're listening. God sometimes in our lives will do that to us. He wants to see if we're following him. Because remember, we're not just robots. The Spirit is in us and leading us, and but we have to learn to walk in step with the Spirit, which requires us to be intentional about what we're doing and how we're living our lives, just as the dancer. It requires a sensitivity to his voice and a willingness to follow wherever he may lead. Did you hear that? It's easy to follow God when he's taking us through the mountains and the lush plains and waters everywhere and fruit picked off. Those easy days. But I love what it says. He, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know God's walking with us. And you do realize that God will not only be there with us, but sometimes God will lead us into the valley of the shadow of death because he's got something we need to learn that's going to bring us closer to him. Understand that. God's going to do that in our lives. We keep in step with the Spirit. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. He will make your path straight. Again, some of you, stop trying to do it yourself. Stop trying to make your path straight. Your job is to trust in the Lord and submit to him, and he will make your path straight. An ungodly life, and Paul, Paul also, we're talking about all this, we've been talking about we're a child of God, we're a king's kid, we've been adopted, we're joint heirs, the past is behind us, we're crucified with Christ, all this stuff going on. But Paul wants us to understand it's not just about the things God does, but the old life as well, right? What, what happens to the old life? Because he wants them to realize, and sometimes it's good to look back. Like last Sunday night, we did a 90s night. How many of you here for 90s night, last Sunday night? We sang Shout to the Lord, finally, right? Yay! And it's good sometimes to look back where God has brought us. But we don't want to stay there. Right? Like people will say to me, we need another Brownsville revival. No, we don't. We had it. That was then. I, I don't want what, I, I don't, today I don't want what God did for me then. Because if I want what God did for me then, guess what? I've not moved forward in my life at all. I'm stuck here. 
I don't want to be stuck in the 90s. You with me? I don't want to be stuck in Brownsville Revival. I want what God has for me today, right now. I want him to do in me what he needs to do in me. And so sometimes it's good to be reminded. So Paul says in Galatians 5, 19 to 20, an ungodly life is one that's controlled by the sinful nature. He's reminding us of how we used to be. He's reminding us that those, these acts of the flesh are, are in contrast to the life living in the spirit. He says in Galatians 5, 19, he says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, Paul says, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know what I find interesting about this? This is not a complete list of the way we used to live, right? But we can find ourselves in these, right? But notice in this list, he equates things like sexual immorality with envy. How is that even the same? Right? And he says things like, uh, if, if, you, if you have factions, you, you create dissensions or factions. Or, or He said it's the same as, as idolatry and witchcraft. Are you kidding me? But what he's saying is he understood it, and we understand it, that sin is sin. It doesn't matter what sin it is. If we allow sin in our lives, sin will destroy us, whether it's a sin of envy or the sin of witchcraft. And so he says all these things to us to show us the contrast of the old way. And then the very next verse, Paul goes to the fruit of the Spirit. Y'all like fruit? especially like, like the end of January through middle March, into March, strawberry season. Is that like the best place to be is in Florida during strawberry season? Yeah. And, and well, okay, I like the whipped cream on top of the strawberries as much as I like the strawberries. But the fruit of the Spirit, see, when we walk in step with the Spirit, then our lives will bear fruit that reflects His character. Understand that. The fruit of the Spirit are, are things that happen in our life as a result of what he is doing in us. We bear fruit, and it's his character. The qualities that we're going to look at are evidence of the Spirit's work within us, and they testify to our transformation as followers of Christ. You may not see it. In fact, a lot of times in your own life, you will just live, you're walking in the Spirit, you're looking at God, and, and things are happening, and you don't see the fruit that's happening in your life, but all of a sudden you wake up one morning and go, oh my goodness, I've changed. I'm, I, I can't believe I'm not thinking the way I used to think. Well, what, what, is, what was that? Well, that's the fruit of the Spirit, because the fruit of the Spirit is what happens, is a reflection of His character, a reflection of who He is. It's not a reflection of who we are, it's a reflection of who He is in us. And we see these changes in our life. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says this. But the fruit of the Spirit is, and you might know the list from the King James or other versions, but the words are, are the same. It says, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Oh, I love that last part. I love that last part. Did you know that as much as you all love me, and I know you love me. Wow, that was not a good response. I was hoping for a little like, you know, like, hey, throw, you know, thank you. As much as you love me, you can love me more. Isn't that good? And then when you love me more, guess what? You can still love me more because there's no law against loving somebody too much. And you can love each other. You may not like each other. That's okay. But you still have to love each other. There is no law against being joyful. There's no law against, if, if you, you're full of joy during a worship song and you want to dance and shout, that's okay. There's no law against it. If you want to sit down during worship, that's okay too. If you want to raise one hand or two hands, just make sure you use deodorant, please. Or if you want to have your hands this way or this way or halfway or whatever way you want, it's okay. If you want to stand and just look, if you want to stand with your eyes closed, it's okay. As long as you're filled with the joy of the Lord that's in you. There's no law against being too joyful. And you know what? We love joy. 
There's no, there's no law against any of these. These nine attributes of a godly life that the Holy Spirit works to develop in the lives of those who walk in step with the Spirit. He's trying to develop these things in our lives. Can I say this again? Stop trying to do it yourself. It is the opposite of the acts of flesh. So let's look at those a little bit in detail this morning before we go. 1 Corinthians 13, y'all know this. Love is the first one. Love is un- unconditional love, agape love, right? It's the perfect kind of love. I'm going to read it from the Message Bible, okay? And it says this. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything as plain as day, and if I have the faith to say to this mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I am bankrupt without love. And he describes it. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything. I love that one. Puts up with anything. This guy's obviously never worked in the toddler room. Amen? (laughs) By the way, if you want to volunteer to work in toddlers, (laughs) church, we still need volunteers because our children's church is growing and we need more people to help. And we'd like you to do once a month all we need from you. Okay, back to the sermon. Puts up with anything, including toddlers in children's church. Trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. That's what God, that's the kind of love God's trying to work out in us because that reflects his character. Next one's joy. Joy is state of rejoicing or happiness. There's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is what the world has. Happiness is when you spend hours baking a pumpkin pie for your pastor because you love him so much. And you, you just work, you got flour all over you, you got pumpkin pie everywhere, but this beautiful pumpkin pie that you take an hour, you put it in the oven, it comes out, it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life, and you're so happy, and you give it to the pastor, and he's so happy, and he eats the whole thing in five seconds. That happiness is fleeting, right? Because now it's gone. But joy is not fleeting. Joy comes from God. When we have joy, in Nehemiah 8.10 is the scripture. There, things aren't all, all great in Nehemiah. If you read the book of Nehemiah, people, you know, they're trying to build the wall. The enemy's coming after them. Even people within their own are trying to keep it. You know, it's, all these things are happening. And he says, hey, don't worry about those things. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We find our joy not in things, although that brings happiness, and we can find joy in each other, and we, we're supposed to find joy in each other, but the joy ultimately that we have comes from Him. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And so we've got to keep that in mind. God is trying to work out in our lives the character, His character, which means when we see people going through difficult situations in life, and they're, they're, there's something about them. They're, they're not depressed or not dis- they're, There's a joy about them. And we wonder, how are they getting through that? That's important that we see that in each other. Amen? It's the importance of being together, but there's joy. The next one is peace. Harmony, tranquility, or another translation is freedom from worry. And since we're talking about living in freedom, that's what we want. Freedom from worry. Peace is not the absence of or distraction from other things happening, the absence of war. That's not peace. If you've been a Christian very long, you know that your, your life is a battlefield, right? Your life's a battlefield. The God of all creation and the enemy of your soul are always at war, always fighting against you, always coming against you. So peace isn't an absence of war. It isn't an absence of, 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 of destru- uh, destruction or distraction or things like that. That's not peace. Peace is freedom from worry. Philippians 4, 6, 7 says, do not be 
anxious about anything. So what can we be anxious about? Nothing. Why? Because in every situation with prayer and petition, we can present our request to God. The reason we don't have to be anxious about situations is because we can take that to God and we know not only is he there, but he listens to us, but that he's actively involved in our lives and working things out for our good. So we don't have to live with anxiety. We don't have to be anxious. We don't have to be worry warts because we can take it to God. And then he says right after that, and the peace of God, he'll take your anxiety and bring you peace that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts. The next one's forbearance or patience. And some of you right now are smelling the spaghetti lunch. Anybody? Anybody getting hungry, ready to eat? And right now, you, God is working out patience in your life because you're ready to get that food and eat it. But I'm not done yet. So God's not done working out patience in you for the next 10 minutes or so. As a reminder, don't forget, go out to the left around, get your spaghetti dinner if you've already paid for it. If you haven't paid for it, there's a few left that you can get after the service. But be patient, patient, right? We're we're, we're forbearance, forbearance, patience, calm, Ephesians 4, Two says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, bearing one another in love. Listen, do you know why that we are to be patient with each other? Can I, can I tell you a secret? Okay, don't, don't, everybody promise you won't tell everybody this secret. The reason we're to be patient with each other is because God's not done with you. God's not done with you. So I have to be patient with you. And here's the good news. God's not done with me yet either. So you have to be patient with me. And we have to be patient with each other. Because while God is doing a great work, we are to, rather than, rather than saying, oh, what's going on with pastor? What's wrong with him? How about we pray? Hey, pastor, how's everything going? Hey, everything good? I know she missed a couple weeks at church. What's going on? We're to be patient with each other, patient with each other. Next one is kindness. Provide something or an act of kindness. Uh, Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Listen, there, there doesn't take much to be kind. Even when we're having a bad day. You ever had a bad day? No one's ever had a bad day? Yeah. Maybe you had a bad day that's like you had a bad week, right? Like your bad day seems like a whole week we can still be kind to each other. And not just to each other, but to those in the world. Because you know what they need? You know, sometimes people just need a little kindness. Sometimes people need a smile, right? And sometimes we don't feel like smiling, but guess what? We know God is at work in our lives. We know God is working things out for our good. We don't have to worry about what's happening in our lives, but we can show kindness to others who don't have God working in their life. So we can be kind to them. The next one is this, it's goodness. We sang a couple of songs about the goodness of God. And God is trying to work goodness in us and doing good. Galatians 6.10 says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. You know who that includes? All people. Your neighbor, your brother or your sister. You know, the one that took his knuckle and beat on your chest while he held your arm down? Be good to him. (laughs) Everybody. We're to be good to people and show goodness to do good. It doesn't take much to do good. I I read in one of the posts this week that somebody, an older person that that usually mows lawn said, whoever came and mowed my lawn this week, thank you. I've been under the weather. I couldn't do it. Isn't that what we should be doing? Doing good to people? The next one is faithfulness, and that can be steadfastness, trustworthiness, faithfulness. James 1, 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. God wants us to be faithful in all we do. Now, notice I didn't say perfect because remember, God's not done with us yet. We're not perfect yet, but he does want us to be faithful, and he's working faithfulness out in our lives. God, if we allow God, 
He will work that out in our lives because that's one of his characteristics. He's a faithful God. Aren't you glad God is faithful to you? And that's how God wants us to be in our lives, to be faithful people, to be counted as faithful. The next one is gentleness. This would be gentleness, meekness, or humility. Proverbs 51, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Yeah, I, this is a bad one for me when I'm in the car. And I'm just glad nobody's in there with me. But God's in there with me. So God's working out this with me. Be gentle with people who, who, who are morons when they drive. Right? Show gentleness to them. We've got to be gentle. Meekness, humility. That's what God's trying to work out in our lives. And the last one is this, self-control. And the Greek word means self-control. Self-control. Titus 2, 11, 12, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly pastures and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Listen. We all need to practice self-control, but this is the self-control that God brings in our lives. What God is trying to work out in us is, is what the Scripture says. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness. There, there are times in your life, that, and, and I've seen this and uh, talked with a friend this week, and he said that he'd been going through so much, just battle after battle, and man, you just, it, it'd make your head spin. You're like, Wow. You know, just the things that are happening at work and home and, and just all these things that are going on in his life. And he's like, you know, and, and when all of this was done, he says, I, I look back and I'm like, wow. One of the things that I, that I have never been able to is self-control. I've always had to say what was on my mind. Anybody like that? I always got to tell someone. I always got to say or got to do it. And he's like, but through all this, I said, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He's working these things out in us to show his character. When the world sees people who are living for God, walking in step with the Spirit, who are displaying the fruit of the Spirit, not because we're good, right? Not because we're good. There's a lot of these things I struggle with, and you do too. We struggle in some of these areas. You know, I, I want to beat my horn a lot. I want to yell at people when they don't know what they're driving. They shouldn't have, or did you get your driver's license? You shouldn't have a driver's license. You should hire a driver. Or here's a good name, walk, get some exercise. I don't, God's still working out things in me as well. And so even if there's areas of your life that the fruit, you don't see that fruit happening, sometimes you don't even see the fruit. But other people do. And people in the world are watching us. And when they begin to see the fruit, of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all the way down to self-control. And they realize that how come you're not losing your temper? Because the Holy Spirit's working us.